Positive Support Community of Practice, Introduction to Minnesota's Positive Supports Rule, Minnesota Rule 9544, October 13, 2015. Next definition we want to cover is that of seclusion. Again, this is a definition that has changed uh, a number of times uh, through legislation. As it now sits, seclusion means, one, removing a person involuntarily to a room from which exit is prohibited mm -hmm. by a staff person, or a mechanism such as a lock, a device, or an object positioned to hold the door closed or otherwise prevent the person from leaving the room, or otherwise involuntarily removing or separating a person from an area, activity, situation, or social contact with others, and blocking or preventing the person's return. So in uh, 245D uh, was first created, our definitions of timeout and seclusion overlapped in many ways. Uh, what we want to call it with seclusion here is that someone is involuntarily removed somewhere, and then they're not allowed to leave that area. Timeout, as it sits now, uh, means uh, also the involuntary removal of a person for a period of time to a designated area. But uh, timeout di differs from seclusion because the person is not prevented from leaving. There is an allowance that under this chapter, timeout does not mean voluntary removal or self-removal for the purpose of calming, prevention of escalation, or de-escalation of behavior. Nor does it mean taking a brief break or rest from an activity for the purpose of providing the person an opportunity to regain self-control. So over the years, as uh, these uh, definitions have been revised, uh, we've noted at least seven differing definitions of the use of timeout in the community. Uh, so this one is specific, again, to that involuntary removal of a person uh, where that person is not prevented from leaving. An example uh, would be uh, bringing someone involuntarily to a chair, but not uh, making them stay there. We also heard uh, from, the, from uh, many clinicians that uh, there are uses of timeout uh, that are accepted best practice. And the allowance in the uh, second uh, uh, sentence of this uh, definition is meant to allow for those uh, best practices as we understand them, and as legislature understands them, I should say. Next definition is that of an aversive procedure. It's defined in 245D as the application of an aversive stimulus contingent upon the occurrence of a behavior for the purposes of reducing or eliminating the behavior. And I think the most common example uh, that we heard uh, during our legislative sessions was the use of spanking uh, to reduce the use of, uh, to reduce some behavior. But of course, many other procedures could fall under this def definition. One of our often confused uh, uh, definitions is that of a, a deprivation procedure. Uh, it's defined in 245D as the removal of a positive reinforcer following a response resulting in, or intended to result in, a decrease in the frequency, duration, or intensity of that response. Oftentimes, the positive reinforcer available is goods, services, or activities to which the person is normally entitled. The removal is often in the form of a delay or postpone, po postponement of the positive reinforcer. And it wasn't necessarily clarified in 245D, but this definition did cover uh, things like response cost procedures where tokens were taken away for negative or maladaptive behavior or where levels were dropped where a person uh, lost responsibility. Those all fell underneath this definition of deprivation procedure. Due to the confusion around uh, this definition, a number of examples uh, were are now specifically prohibited of deprivation procedures within the rule, which we're about to cover in a minute. And here they are. So these are the prohibited interventions that are specifically prohibited by 9544. The first is prone restraint, restraining a person in a face down uh, position on the floor, using metal handcuffs, hand, handcuffs or leg hobbles, use of phoretic shock, speaking to a person in a manner that ridicules, demeans, threatens, or is abusive, using physical intimidation or shows of force, Containing, restricting, isolating, secluding, or otherwise removing a person from normal activities when it is medically contraindicated or without monitoring the person. Continued here. Using painful techniques, including intentional infliction of pain or injury, intentional infliction of fear of pain of injury, dehumanization and degradation, hyperextending or twisting a person's body parts, Tripping or pushing a person, 
denying or restricting a person's access to equipment and devices such as wheelchairs, walkers, hearing aids, and communication boards that facilitates a person's functioning. It is noted, however, that when the temporary removal of the equipment or device is necessary to prevent injury to the person or others, or serious, serious damage to the equipment or device itself, the equipment or device must be returned to the person as soon as imminent risk of serious damage is passed. Continued with the prohibited interventions, using punishment of any kind, requiring a person to assume and maintain a specified physical position or posture, using forced exercise, totally or partially restricting a person's senses, presenting intense sounds, lights, or other sensory stimuli, using a noxious smell, taste, substance, or spray, depriving a person of or restricting access to normal goods and services. And I should note we don't uh, include it uh, in uh, the PowerPoint today, but there is a definition of normal goods and services within the rule. Requiring a person to earn normal goods and services. <clears throat> Using token reinforcement programs or level programs that include a response cost or negative punishment component. So again, that's clarifying what deprivation means there or what is included in deprivation. Using a person receiving services to discipline another person receiving services and using any action or procedure that is medically or psychologically contraindicated. So again, we've got a lot of services now that fall underneath or could fall underneath the rule. Some of these may sound like duplication from your current licensing standards, uh, but uh, this was meant to be a consistent set of standards governing services to persons with developmental disabilities or related condition. And so some of these are maybe duplicates, some of these may be very new then as well to your program. So again, as we're talking about what falls underneath restrictive uh, interventions, emergency use manual restraint is the last procedure that uh, constitutes a restrictive intervention. Emergency use manual restraint is defined in 245D as using a manual restraint when a person poses an imminent risk of physical harm to self or others and is the least restrictive intervention that would achieve safety. Property damage, verbal aggression, or a person's refusal to receive or participate in treatment or programming on their own do not constitute an emergency underneath this definition. And again, to clarify, emergency use of manual restraint is not uh, considered prohibited. Under 245D, it is a restricted procedure, uh, meaning that its use is restricted to those conditions listed above and those in 245D-061. So veering away from restrictive interventions, so we have restrictive interventions which cover prohibited and restricted interventions, and now we have those uh, procedures that are considered permitted underneath the rule. The first we should note that anything that is permitted under 245D is also permitted by the rule. And of course, uh, we have some other procedures here which include positive support strategies, positive verbal correction, the temporary withholding or removal of objects being used to hurt self or others. That was one of the uh, one question that we received quite frequently with 245D is whether or not a weapon could be temporarily removed. The rule clarifies again that it can. Mechanical devices for medical conditions. Emergency use of manual restraint as long as it meets the conditions uh, noted is permitted. And then physical contact or instructional techniques using the least restrictive alternative possible to one, calm or comfort a person, protect a person at risk of frequent falls, facilitate a person's completion of tasks or response when person does not resist or minimally resists, to block or redirect a person with less than 60 seconds of contact, and to redirect behavior not posing a serious threat with less than 60 seconds of contact. So looking at some of the questions that we received in this area, there were questions about whether or not hugs or hand over hand guidance could be uh, used, and uh, they can according to this provision in the rule, depending on how that hug or hand over hand guidance is used. So that covered a lot of information uh, on positive support strategies, person-centered planning, uh, restrictive interventions, and uh, permitted uh, procedures. Next, we're going to move into the requirements surrounding functional behavior assessments, another area where we have received uh, quite a few questions, particularly over the last uh, two weeks. So 
So functional behavior assessments have, uh, were not necessarily required under 245D, which was, I think, all, often confused by our 245D providers, mainly uh, probably stemming from the uh, uh, feature on the behavior intervention report form asking about whether or not an FBA had occurred within the last 12 months. There was no requirement that an FBA occurred at that time. Uh, it was only, uh, that was a question that was used for technical assistance uh, when it was noted that uh, teams were having uh, issues, uh, reoccurring issues, and uh, our staff often uh, recommended again that FBAs take place. Now with the rule, there is a requirement that FBAs take place under certain con uh, conditions. They're defined as an assessment that operationally defines target behaviors, identifies the situations in which the target behavior is likely to occur and not occur, and generates a hypothesis about, hypothesis about why the behaviors occur. According to the rule, the FBA must be conducted by a qualified professional, and it must consist of direct observation of the person and evaluation of the following elements, biological factors, psychological factors, environmental factors, and quality of life indicators. And our most frequent question about FBAs is when it, when it uh, is really required the rule. In the rule it is noted that an FBA is required when a qualified professional or external qualified professional develops or modifies a written intervention to change a target behavior. And before we get in again to some of those answers to the FAQs, we kind of want to talk a little bit about qualified professionals. The definition of qualified professional in the rule is actually the longest definition within the rule and I'm not going to read that for you here today because it's actually about two pages long. But we do want to note that a qualified professional is defined separately for each service and license. So each provider must review and know uh, which uh, person is qualified to complete the FBA and develop positive support transition plans for their service. For some of our services, that, uh, po that responsibility can go to case managers. To qualify as a qualified professional in uh, many of our license types, there's also a requirement uh, that a person have received two years of work experience, writing positive support or treatment plans, and demonstrating competency in a commissioner's assessment, the DHS commissioner's assessment. So again, just to cover uh, our questions about uh, the, the need for an FBA, we do want to note that the need to conduct an FBA is tied to the development or revision of a positive support transition plan, or PSTP. As noted, written interventions to change a target behavior are only required to be created or changed during the PSTP development revision process. An FBA is required when a written intervention is modified to change a target behavior. The next question is whether or not an FBA is needed for every interfering behavior. Again, the answer would be no, that an FBA is not required for every interfering behavior. An interfering behavior actually becomes a target behavior during the FBA process which is required when those written interventions are developed or modified to change a target behavior. So uh, for those of you that are currently familiar with the positive support transition plan, and again, we'll cover some of those parts uh, later in this presentation. If you uh, are developing a positive support transition plan, an FBA would be required. And there are uh, areas where you need to note uh, the outcomes of that FBA on the positive support transition plan itself. Then if you're going to modify uh, the positive support transition plan in the future, uh, any substantial change to parts B or C of the positive support transition plan would require an accompanying FBA. Parts B and C cover target behaviors and target interventions within the positive support transition plan. Next common question we receive about FBAs, wondering whether or not there are standards for how quickly that FBA must be initiated and completed. The FBA is required when a qualified professional develops or modifies a written intervention to change a target behavior. As I just noted, uh, if you're uh, making a change to parts B or C of the positive support transition plan or developing a positive support transition plan for the first time, it would be expected that that FBA is done prior to those uh, revisions or development. And again, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with the Positive Support Transition Plan, we're going to give you those links here today uh, so that you can see it uh, for yourself. A number of changes were actually made to the Positive Support Transition Plan document itself to make sure that it's in line with the uh, Positive Supports Rule and that the same language is used throughout. 
The next question that we often receive uh, has to do with the commissioner's assessment for qualified professionals and where that can be found. Uh, you can see that here that the training is available, the assessment is available on TrainLink. Under the continuing care area, it is uh, uh, titled PSR 100 or the Positive Supports Rule. And uh, at uh, last count, we had about 600 people that have already gone through the assessment and successfully completed it, which means that we possibly have at least 600 qualified professionals out there that needed to take this assessment. Of course, uh, you don't need to, uh, if, uh, even if you're not a qualified professional. So those of you that are persons receiving services, those of you that are family members, case managers, you may be interested in this training as well, and you are welcome to take this training too. And speaking of training, we're going to go into those requirements next. So uh, core training, uh, their training is really uh, split up into two areas. Uh, one is known as core training, the other is function specific training. The core training requirements apply to any staff who develop, implement, monitor, supervise, or evaluate positive support strategies, positive support transition plans, or the emergency use of manual restraint. So one of the things that will remind you is that every person uh, that is governed by or has their service governed by this rule must have positive support strategies uh, developed for them, which means any of your staff working with that person are going to have to, most likely at least, implement or monitor positive support strategies. So the direct care staff working with that person will need to take the core training. The core training is noted as eight hours. It has to be delivered by a qualified individual. It has to include the demonstration of competency and knowledge. And I'm not going to read these ones uh, verbatim to you, uh, but these are the different uh, topics that are required under the core training area. Next, we have function-specific training. Function-specific training uh, is required for staff who develop positive support strategies, as well as executives, managers, and owners in non-clinical roles. Specific to this category, it's required uh, that they complete four hours of training. One of the uh, words in this uh, section that's really tripped people up is the, the, the use of the term additional, uh, wondering on, of whether or not this means that all of the core training applies to uh, all of the people in this category. Additional is only meant to uh, qualify for those people who also require core training. So not all executives, managers, and owners uh, will require uh, to take the core training then as well. But the, the topics are very specific to those four hours of training. Uh, the training must be on functional behavior assessments, how to apply person-centered planning, how to design and use data systems to measure effectiveness of care, and on supervision. Specifically, how to train, coach, and evaluate staff, and encourage effective communication with the person and the person's team. The next category of function-specific training is specific to license holders, executives, <coughs> managers, and owners in non clinical roles, and I think the thing to note here is that staff who develop positive support strategies is left off of this section. For this category, uh, people do need to complete an additional two hours of training uh, around how to include staff and in organizational decisions, management of the organization based on person-centered thinking and practices, and evaluation of organizational training as it applies to measurement of behavior change and improved outcomes for persons receiving services. So while it's possible, uh, your executives, managers, and owners uh, would only need to take uh, the four and the two hours listed in function-specific training, we do want to note that it is possible that they might need to take the core training as well if those resp job responsibilities are assigned to them as noted in that core training area. <laughs> There's also a requirement in the rule around uh, annual refresher training. It states that license holders must ensure that staff, and we have it italicized here for you, uh, so staff is the key term, that staff complete four hours of refresher training on an annual basis covering each of the training areas listed in subparts one and two that are applicable to the staff and their responsibilities. So I'm just going to back up to call out again uh, the, the use of the term staff in uh, function specific training and that is specific to staff who develop positive support strategies and then our core training uh, applies to all staff then as well. If you can't be considered a staff under one of those areas, the annual refresher training would not apply to you. So our executives, managers, et cetera.
The next key piece of this uh, area in the rule is that uh, surrounding the determination of staff competence. License holders must determine that staff competence, uh, the competence is up to par to perform duties. And it's more than sending them to training. It includes clarifying expectations, demonstrating and modeling the skills, such as practicing and role playing as a team. Could include observing staff performance and providing feedback and support, providing job aids, seeking other validation of competence, and having someone on call who is competent and can mentor when a person is learning skills. So again, we're going to cover our frequently asked questions here. And we've had a lot of questions about training, uh, but this seems to be our number one again. It has to do with whether or not all executives need to complete core training as well as function-specific training. Uh, the answer is no. Only executives who are also responsible to develop, implement, monitor, supervise, or evaluate positive support strategies, positive support transition plan, or the emergency is main restraint need to complete the core training. And the next one that has to do with whether or not executives need to complete that annual refresher training. And again, we covered that answer is no, uh, for the, unless that executive can be considered a staff under subpart one or two. Then they would need to complete the annual refresher training every year. So for some executives and managers, uh, they may only need to take the six hours of training up front. Our next frequently asked question in this area has to do with uh, who qualifies as a qualified individual to train on the topics in core training. Again, we do have a definition of qualified professional uh, in the rule, and I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. Qualified individual is not actually defined in the rule, and as such, the determination of who is qualified is left to the license holder. And our next common question in this area is whether or not the eight hours of core training are meant to be in addition or cumulative to the training hours already required under uh, license provisions. What we can say there is that each topic area of the core training must be addressed. If you have received other recent training that is directly on point with what uh, the topic uh, identifies, then it can qualify, as long as you can document that the content is equivalent. So what that means is that you could possibly double up training that you are per currently performing. But again, it would have to directly address the topic noted in the rule. All right, and with that, we're going to move to documentation and reporting. So I think, uh, again, one of the main questions that we heard through the promulgation process is what is ultimately going to be required of uh, license holders? And here is a, a kind of an overview of those documentation requirements. The first will be uh, to incorporate positive support strategies into an existing treatment service or other individual plan. Common question there is whether or not certain documents need to be created to document positive support strategies. And again, we just want to note that the allowance is here is to incorporate it into an existing treatment service or individual plan. So again, we have a lot of different types of license holders that are now underneath the purview of this rule. Depending on what uh, type of uh, document that you're using and what type of plan you're using, you may incorporate that into an existing plan. Everyone is also required to maintain that policy on the emergency use of manual restraint, and that's really so that the notification can be given uh, to the person or their guardian about uh, what uh, your policy is on the emergency use of manual restraint. There's a requirement around the completion of training and competency assessment for each staff. Everyone must also report incidents via the behavior intervention report form to the Department of Human Services. And there are requirements around the creation of positive support transition plans. So basically, here's a lot of language as well. Providers should track and maintain information that helps them improve and maintain quality of their services. It should also help those who review services identify how services are being approached and their overall quality. It should be clear who services are provided to, the types of services, and when those services started and ended. It should be clear if the person is benefiting from the services, making progress on their person-centered goals and their positive support strategies. If a person was not making progress or lived or worked in a partially or completely segregated environment, it should be clear as to why and what was tried to help the person become more included in the community. Personnel records, including training records, are also important to maintain. And we do want to note that documentation required by the rule must be retained in a permanent record 
for at least five years after creation. And here's the specifics around when that emergency use of manual restraint or UMR policy uh, notice is required. That policy is uh, required, their notice is required at service initiation. Riders, uh, license holders, must provide notice of the, uh, the policy on emergency use of manual restraint to the person or the party. <coughs> Notification is also required whenever emergency use of manual restraint policy is changed. And for those of you that uh, perhaps don't have one of these in place yet, even though it's required by the rule, uh, we do want to note that there is a sample policy for 245D license holders at the link here. If, you're, if you are a 245D uh, license holder, you have to have a policy and you've already had to submit it uh, upon your application. For those of you that are 245A license holders, you will need to modify this document to make it applicable to your service then as well. And here's the specifics around uh, documentation of staff training. License holders must document completion of core training, additional training, and competency testing or assessment for each staff in the personnel record. The license holder must document the date of the training, testing or assessment was completed, the number of training hours per subject area, and the name of qualifications of the trainer or instructor. The license holder must also verify and maintain evidence of staff qualifications in the personnel record, including documentation of the following. A, education and experience qualifications relevant to the staff's scope of practice, responsibilities assigned to the staff, and needs of the general population of the persons served by the program. And professional licensure, registration or certification when applicable. So before when we noted that it might be possible uh, to count to training towards previous licensing requirements as well as the rule, uh, to do so, uh, your training documentation would need to meet uh, these criteria. Now we're going to move on to positive support transition plans. So positive support transition plans, uh, there are a specific document required to be developed by the expanded support team to implement positive support strategies to eliminate the use of prohibited procedures, to avoid the emergency use of manual restraint, to prevent the person from physically harming self or others, and improve the person's quality of life. A positive support transition plan is required according to the rule after three uses of an emergency use of manual restraint in 90 days or four uses in 180 days. Again, we want to note that emergency use of manual restraint is not prohibited, it is restricted. And so some of the timelines that you'll see for phasing out prohibited interventions in 245D do not apply to the emergency use of manual restraint. It is up to the person and their team uh, when a positive support transition plan only incorporating emergency use of manual restraint will be phased out. A positive support transition plan is also required before a prohibited uh, procedure is implemented. And it's very specific in statute uh, when uh, those prohibited procedures can be used uh, through a positive support transition plan. For persons admitted to a program after the rule is effective, or for persons with whom a prohibited procedure was used uh, currently unused on the effective date of the rule, positive support transition plans must be developed and implemented within 30 calendar days of service initiation or rule effect and phased out no later than 11 months from the dates of implementation. So it is possible if you're now underneath the purview of this rule and you were using uh, something like mechanical restraint uh, with someone that you serve, it was possible that you would not need to immediately phase out the use. If your team has determined that it would not be therapeutic to do so, under the conditions of positive support transition plans, you could create a plan and you would have 11 months to phase out the use of mechanical restraint in that circumstance. And again, we want to note that positive support transition plans are a very specific document. 245D notes that uh, the plans must be created on the forms and in the manner determined by the commissioner. You can find a positive support transition plan in our electronic document area. Uh, here you can see a screenshot of the front page. We want to note that all of our positive support transition plan uh, documents uh, start with uh, the number 6810. And there are a number of documents related to the positive support transition plan, which we'll cover in just a moment. But uh, again, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the positive support transition plan, there are several sections uh, to each of these plans. Uh, the first is on uh, background information on the person and the provider itself. The next is on target interventions, those interventions that are being phased out or avoided. Uh, there's a section on target behaviors, those uh, types of behaviors that typically lead to a target intervention. 
and uh, plans must focus on trying to decrease uh, the incidence of target behaviors as well as target interventions. There's a section on the positive support transition plan that incorporates a crisis support plan. Teams must also identify quality of life indicators for the person and track them as well. There's a section on measurement of data and of course on informed consent then as well. And here you see the different documents that are uh, related to the positive support transition plan. Uh, the positive support transition plan itself is uh, EDOC uh, form 6810. At least every 90 days, a review of the positive support transition plan and the procedures within uh, must be completed. And it must be completed on the positive support transition plan review form, which is uh, noted as 6810A. The manner in which the commissioner wants positive support transition plans to be created are found in the positive support transition plan instructions, which are EDOC form 6810B. And then for your benefit, uh, to, uh, we worked with the University of Minnesota to create a manual uh, titled Developing Positive Support Transition Plans and Provider Guide. Right now the title, and it's still in flux, uh, we're waiting for uh, provider guides for 245D providers. We're waiting for 245D to be eliminated. This is meant to be an a, a guide for any provider creating a positive support transition plan. You can find that in our EDOC se uh, section again as 6810C.